Linux, everywhere power. Linux won high-performance computing by doing the boring things perfectly. Every system on the top 500 list runs a Linux-based operating system because it lets engineers strip the OS to the essentials, tune the kernel for specific interconnects and accelerators, and deploy at scale without vendor lock-in. When you are chasing exascale performance, configurable and stable beats pretty UI every time. Linux became the default for scientific clusters because its driver model and kernel modules let vendors ship highly optimized stacks for InfiniBand, custom fabrics like Slingshot and GPUs without waiting for a proprietary release cycle. If your network card speaks in acronyms, Linux already speaks the dialect. On the server side, Linux won on three levers, cost, control, and composability. You can run it for free, rebuild it to remove anything you do not need, and pair it with the exact web server, runtime, and database you want. Enterprises discovered that avoiding per-core or per-socket licensing is not just a philosophical stance. It is a budget line that disappears. Cloud cemented the win. The big clouds standardized their infrastructure on Linux because it is easier to automate, containerize, and harden at scale. Whether you deploy containers, virtual machines, or bare metal images, the automation tooling assumes Linux by default and everything else by exception. Market share debates aside, the operational center of gravity in modern cloud is Linux. For developers, Linux offered the shortest path from I have code to it runs in production. Package managers, reproducible builds, and first-class container support meant less time negotiating with installers and more time shipping. That is not ideology. Security and reliability pushed it over the top. The permission model, namespaces, and C groups combined with rapid, transparent patching made Linux the safer default for internet-facing workloads. When a vulnerability drops, maintainers land fixes quickly, and vendors backport with predictable cadence. It is not glamorous. It just works and keeps working. Result? Supercomputers, clouds, and the majority of internet infrastructure treat Linux not as an alternative, but as the baseline. The interesting question in 2025 is not why Linux, it is which Linux, because the answer changes per workload, and that flexibility is the quiet superpower. Android, open core, global dominance. Android started as an open source project called the Android Open Source Project, or AOSP. That's the skeleton of the operating system. The kernel, drivers, system libraries, and framework code. Google builds on top of AOSP with proprietary apps and services like the Play Store and Google Maps. But the foundation remains open. That open core was enough to let manufacturers like Samsung, Xiaomi, and countless smaller brands use it freely, modify it, and ship their own Android-based devices. No licensing fee, no per-device royalty, just build, customize, and sell. The result? Android took roughly 70% of the global smartphone market and never looked back. Google may control the trademark, but AOSP's flexibility lets forks exist everywhere, from Amazon's Fire OS to Huawei's Harmony OS. Even specialty devices like car infotainment systems, smart TVs, and handheld consoles like the Steam Deck rely on Android or AOSP derivatives. It worked because open source solved two problems at once, cost and control. Hardware makers could ship a modern operating system without paying Microsoft or Apple, and they could tailor it for their own hardware quirks. A factory in Shenzhen can spin up an Android-based phone in weeks, something unthinkable with a closed OS. The dry part is that this freedom still funnels everyone back toward Google's ecosystem. Because the open version lacks Google's apps, certifications, and safety layers. But the core success stands. The world's most used operating system runs on an open foundation. That foundation made phones affordable, diversified hardware innovation, and gave billions of people internet access for the first time. Even Google itself benefits from the openness. Instead of fighting clones, it uses them to spread its services and data collection network. Android became not just a product, but the world's largest open infrastructure experiment. Chromium and the web's open backbone. 
Chromium is the open source browser engine that quietly won the internet. It powers Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Opera, Brave, and dozens of smaller browsers, all running on the same base code. When Microsoft abandoned its own Edge HTML engine in 2019 and rebuilt Edge on Chromium, it marked the end of the browser wars. Even one of the biggest software companies on Earth decided that maintaining a proprietary web engine was not worth the pain. Why? Because web standards evolve faster than any single corporation can keep up with. New HTML features, JavaScript APIs, graphics layers, and security models appear constantly. Chromium's open model lets thousands of engineers worldwide fix, patch, and add features in parallel, far faster than a closed team ever could. Chromium also underpins Electron, the framework used to build desktop apps like Visual Studio Code, Discord, and Slack. That means even many native apps are just web browsers in disguise running on top of this open engine. It's a strange kind of victory, open source code maintaining the very walled gardens it once tried to replace. For Google, it's convenient. They get to steer the project's direction while keeping it nominally open, ensuring that their engine becomes the de facto web standard. For everyone else, it's survival. Developers only have to optimize for one dominant engine instead of a dozen incompatible ones. The open nature of Chromium also drove better performance and security testing. Independent researchers can audit code, find exploits, and even contribute patches. That openness, ironically, made the web's most corporate browser engine more secure. So while Apple still insists on its WebKit-only policy on iOS, the rest of the planet runs Chromium derivatives. The open engine didn't just beat billion-dollar companies, it absorbed them. VLC, the media player that plays everything. VLC began as a student project at École Centrale Paris in 1996. The goal was simple, create a network-capable media player that could stream and play any format you threw at it. 25 years later, it's still free, open source, and somehow runs on nearly every operating system known to humanity. Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and even obscure platforms like BSD or Haiku. The magic behind VLC is its built-in codec library, where commercial players like QuickTime or Windows Media Player used to nag you about missing codecs, VLC ships with support for almost everything, from ancient MPEG-1 files to 4K HEVC and modern AV1 video. It doesn't ask questions, it just plays. That it just works philosophy made VLC the Swiss army knife of media playback. It can stream over local networks, transcode files, capture screens, convert formats, and even act as a video server, all without ads, telemetry, or licensing pop-ups. Every feature you never knew you needed hides in a drop-down menu somewhere. VLC's open nature also means it often becomes the first platform to adopt bleeding-edge features. Developers can integrate new codecs or experimental streaming protocols before they're standardized. As of 2025, the Videoland team is even testing offline AI-based subtitle generation, a feature commercial platforms still struggle to offer without cloud processing or privacy trade-offs. Corporate players tried to compete. Microsoft had Windows Media Player, Apple had QuickTime, and Real Networks had RealPlayer, but all were tied to proprietary formats and business models. VLC ignored the market entirely and focused on one mission, play everything. The result is a free tool used by hundreds of millions, embedded in countless apps and quietly running behind the scenes of streaming tools and media workflows. It's not flashy, but it beat billion dollar giants simply by refusing to stop working when their products did. FFMPEG, the invisible workhorse of digital media. If VLC is the face of open media, FFMPEG is the machinery underneath. It's an open source framework that handles video and audio encoding, decoding, conversion, and streaming. Almost every app that plays or manipulates media, YouTube, OBS Studio, Handbrake, Zoom, even some video games, uses FFMPEG under the hood. The project started in 2000 with one purpose, to provide a unified set of tools for handling every multimedia standard without waiting for corporate approval 
or paying for proprietary codecs. Over time, it became the de facto toolkit for anyone building anything that touches video or sound. When you export a video from an editor, stream gameplay, or compress a file, there's a good chance FFmpeg is doing the heavy lifting. It supports thousands of codecs and containers, MP4, MKV, MOV, H.264, HEVC, VP9, AV1, and audio formats from MP3 to FLAC. It's constantly updated by a global team of developers who chase every new standard the moment it appears. Its command line interface looks intimidating. No glossy GUI, no onboarding tutorial, but that's the point. FFMPEG isn't made for consumers. It's built for tools that serve consumers. You feed it a command, it does the job fast, precise, and with terrifying reliability. Commercial software relies on it because building a proprietary equivalent would take years and cost millions. Adobe Premiere uses parts of FFMPG internally. VLC integrates it. Many mobile and embedded apps wrap FFmpeg to handle video capture or compression. And because it's licensed under LGPL or GPL, companies can legally integrate it without paying royalties, as long as they follow the rules. It's open source that even billion-dollar firms depend on, but rarely acknowledge publicly. If you've ever watched a video, streamed a game, or converted a file, you've already used FFMPEG. You just didn't know it. Kubernetes, the quiet ruler of modern infrastructure. Kubernetes, or K8S, if you like unnecessary abbreviations, started as a Google internal project called Borg. When Google open-sourced a cleaned-up version in 2014, it reshaped how software is deployed and scaled across the world. It wasn't designed to be trendy. It was designed to stop human beings from manually managing servers like it was still 2005. The idea is simple. Containers. Lightweight, isolated environments that run your code. Kubernetes automates how those containers start, stop, scale, and recover across clusters of machines. Instead of babysitting virtual machines, you describe your desired state. How many copies of an app should be running, how they talk to each other, how they recover if something fails, and Kubernetes enforces that state automatically. In practice, it's the orchestral conductor of cloud computing. Every major cloud platform, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, runs Kubernetes under the hood for managed container services. According to CNCF surveys, over 90% of organizations running containers use Kubernetes or a compatible platform. That's not a trend. That's a monopoly born out of practicality. Before Kubernetes, companies had competing tools like Docker Swarm and Apache Mesos. They were simpler, but less flexible. Kubernetes's open governance through the Cloud Native Computing Foundation made it vendor neutral and infinitely extensible. Any developer could build plugins for networking, security, or monitoring, no corporate permission required. Its complexity became both its curse and its moat. Yes, it takes time to learn. Yes, it has a thousand YAML files. But once it's running, it can handle deployments across hundreds or thousands of nodes with minimal human input. For large organizations, that means saving millions in downtime and operations. Today, Kubernetes runs everything from tiny web startups to Netflix-scale infrastructures. The open-source project that began as Google's side hobby quietly became the operating system of the cloud. And every billion-dollar company now builds on it, not against it. Blender, the free 3D suite that refused to die. In the late 1990s, Blender was a small proprietary 3D software developed by a Dutch company called Neo Geo. When that company went bankrupt, the community didn't let it vanish. Instead, users raised 100,000 euros in 2002 to buy the source code and release it under the GNU General Public License. That single decision changed 3D graphics forever. Blender grew from an obscure open source experiment into a full-featured digital content creation suite. It handles modeling, sculpting, rigging, animation, rendering, compositing, video editing, and even 2D drawing, all inside one package. Commercial rivals like Autodesk Maya, 3DS Max, and Cinema 4D charge thousands per license. Blender costs nothing and updates faster. 
Its open architecture turned into its superpower. Anyone can build plugins, add-ons, or integrations. Studios contribute code to get the features they need, and everyone benefits. That's why giants like Ubisoft, Epic Games, and Netflix use Blender internally for parts of their pipelines. Even professional visual effects studios have started to integrate it into real productions. The Blender Foundation doubled down on transparency with open movies. Short films like Big Buck Bunny and Sintel created entirely with Blender and released with all source assets. These projects serve as live demonstrations that open tools can match Hollywood-grade quality. Blender's community is what commercial vendors could never buy. Thousands of artists, developers, and hobbyists constantly improve it, fix bugs, and share tutorials. It evolves faster than closed competitors simply because there are more hands on deck. In 2025, Blender's real impact is its ecosystem. It's now integrated with Unreal Engine, supports AI-assisted texture generation, and exports to nearly every format in the industry. What began as a rescue mission for a bankrupt program became one of the most influential 3D platforms in the world. Blender didn't just compete with billion-dollar software, it embarrassed it. OBS Studio, the open-source broadcast standard, OBS, short for Open Broadcaster Software, started as a one-person hobby project in 2012. It was meant to let gamers stream to Twitch without melting their CPUs. Today, it's a full-fledged broadcast suite used by YouTubers, streamers, and even professional studios. The kicker? It's still completely free. At its core, OBS does what expensive software like Wirecast or vMix charge hundreds for, capture, mix, and stream multiple video and audio sources in real time. It handles scenes, overlays, transitions, and encoding all using open source libraries like FFMPEG under the hood. That's why it runs smoothly on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux with identical functionality. OBS became the de facto standard because of two things, extensibility and trust. Its plugin system lets users build their own capture filters, virtual cameras, and integration with chatbots or donation alerts. Twitch, YouTube, and even Zoom meetings now rely on OBS's virtual camera driver. If you've ever joined a video call where someone's layout looked suspiciously professional, you were probably looking at OBS output. Major platforms ended up supporting OBS natively because they couldn't ignore it. YouTube's official streaming documentation uses OBS screenshots. Twitch certifies it as a recommended encoder. Even hardware companies like Elgato, NVIDIA, and AMD build OBS plugins to optimize their capture cards and GPU. It's also become the backbone of hybrid event production. Conferences, esports tournaments, and live podcasts all use OBS as their control room. The interface might look like it hasn't changed since 2013, because it barely has, but it's stable, lightweight, and endlessly customizable. In 2025, OBS Studio is both a tool and an ecosystem. It powers the Internet's live video infrastructure from bedrooms to broadcast studios, all without subscriptions, licenses, or corporate interference. Open source software didn't just enter the broadcasting world, it became the broadcasting world. There's a great video on the screen now, don't miss it.